There are many ways to look at the world through the eyes of a child and its appearance. Through the eyes of a man and its implications. In a world where someone starves to death every nine seconds, our progress is mocked by the persistence of hunger, ignorance, pestilence, strained communications, unpredictable weather. Search as we might, we have always had to look at Earth's problems from down at the bottom of a pool of atmosphere. There has been no way to get up above the limit of the air, no way to grasp the whole Earth as one, until now. Twenty-two thousand miles up. Here are all the daisies, all the goldfish, and all the problems, all in one big, fat, fuzzy ball. Just what does outer space up there have to do with our problems down here? Let's take a closer look. Rockport, Texas. Who at this age could really care what happens thousands of miles up in the sky? Who indeed? Certainly this whole playground full of kids. Space means a lot to them. In the case of this girl, it's her life. Here she is a few years ago with her mother. Hurricane Carla howled down the Gulf Coast like a runaway train. Hurricane Carla, located in the Gulf by one of our very first Tyro satellites. With the help of pictures from the satellite, people had time to get ready for one of the biggest storms ever to hit the Gulf Coast. That's how Wendy was born, on high ground, in the fourth year of space. Only one jump behind the computer, the rocket. and the satellite. Wendy is unquestionably a child of the space age. Hi, Wendy. Hi, Mark. Hi, Mark. Here you. How was your geography taken? I made nice four. Well, I see all that studying paid off. I missed six, though. Well, that's not bad. But the paths of Wendy down here and our space program up there have connected more than once since that storm. They have a lot more in common than just that they were born at about the same time. The savings to the people down on Earth, just through better weather forecasting alone, are huge. Enough to affect her family's grocery bill, in fact. To some of her neighbors, space already helps to say when to plant and when to harvest. Satellites are bringing television coverage of world events instantly into her home and into her classroom, as well as making it possible to telephone anywhere in the world.
space is even helping her friend Hernando avoid bad weather. In the future, it may help him bring in more shrimp, find his way home, even get himself rescued if there's trouble. All this, Wendy sees with a child's eyes. She doesn't even question it. At this moment in her life, her biggest question is... When's Daddy coming home? Ladies and gentlemen, the captain speaking. I wish I could give you a better report on the weather, but the weather over the New York area has gotten worse, and we have been rerouted to our alternate at Baltimore. This has increased the traffic in the New York area and will require us to hold at Yarmouth, Nova Scotia for a while. Please keep your seatbelt fastened. Thank you. Now the adult mind asks some very adult questions, such as, here I am hanging up here, and just where are all those scientific breakthroughs they keep telling us about? Where are they? Did you know that it was nearly a hundred years between the theory of the electric motor and the time you could buy one? Sorry, but we can't wait a hundred years anymore. Today, things are happening too fast. Every day, applied science, that is technology, is breathing harder down the neck of pure science, that is theory. Of all the people who ever lived, one in 25 is alive today out there walking around. And we will use, in our one generation, more of the Earth's resources than all the other people have ever used since time began. The race to space, then, has become very much a race to apply some of the things we've learned from space to problems here at home. Today, only a few years after it all began, the results are really beginning to show. Our astronauts have given us thousands of pictures of our Earth from about 120 miles up. This is our planet, the blue planet. These lands which man has roamed for thousands of centuries without ever seeing the connections among some of its features. But now, a geologist can see fractures in the Earth's surface and other geologic features which don't appear even on up-to-date maps. He can see forms which may change long-standing theories about the formation of the continents and origins of the world. He can see large-scale folds, ruptures, and bubbles in the land, forms which may also reveal unsuspected deposits of minerals, oils, and precious metals. A geographer gets information on soil and rock types, drainage, types of vegetation. A soil scientist, a forester, or an agriculturist may see new areas to be developed and plan the harvesting of existing ones. The result of all this may be that someday drought can be forecast to give man more time to take remedial action. An engineer can make broad-scale plans for a highway, a dam, or railroad from analysis of the contours of the ground. A meteorologist can see weather formations so huge that they have never been observed from ground or air. He can join the ecologist and the hydrologist in analyzing a rainstorm in southern Florida and observe silting at the mouth of the Colorado River. A picture like this one can be filtered to obtain many levels of color separation. We can see depth contours very close to those painstakingly acquired by soundings from ships. Suddenly, a hydrographer is a lot closer to an understanding of the sea and how to take food from it. Here in the Bahamas, off the coast of Florida, is a place where we may learn how to change fishermen from hunters into farmers. What look like clouds are really underwater sandbars. There are the grasses, stones, the ocean floor. And as we separate the details of reflected light, we can isolate each feature. These are sea meadows where fish graze. As the scientist learns more about their grazing habits, the world comes closer to finding an adequate food supply.
these pictures, many taken for other purposes, are now of great value to our program of space applications. There will be more benefits from newer pictures from other satellites. Benefits to science, to conservation, to development and food supply in all countries, rich and poor. All this has come to us from cameras which in effect take the eye hundreds of miles above the Earth. But the eye, like the other senses we're born with, is easily deceived. It sees one thing where there's more than one, and only one thing where there's something else. Restricted to narrow bands of visible light, your eye sees a house cat only as a house cat. But the eyes of science can see a house cat as heat, as chemicals, as energy, or as numbers. Give a computer the right parts, and it can see and sketch the house cat as a moving whole. Even house cat past and house cat future. These are some of the ways science can see. Some are being put in orbit. Others are tested experimentally aboard airplanes. Together, in satellites and in planes, sensors give us important data. Sensors can see where men can't in the infrared or ultraviolet light. They can record energy from X-rays, lasers, radar signals, gamma rays. Day and night, weather satellites now see the world as clouds and storms. And in the future, they'll also be able to see the whole world as heat at the surface of sea and land, and as air temperatures at varying heights. Here is a typhoon called Marie, growing, and experimentally shown as temperatures and cloud heights. This is Scranton, Pennsylvania, seen by experimental infrared sensors being tested from a plane. These spots, seen in infrared, are heat from underground fires in abandoned coal mines. Early detection of underground fires means lives can be saved since the fumes can be deadly. Sensors which detect heat can take the pulse of a volcano. From infrared pictures of farmland, remote sensors can tell about drainage patterns and swamps and see different kinds of crops. A picture of rangeland clearly shows differences in vegetation, a key to planting and grazing potential. Or infrared can also show us sick trees. The healthy ones are pink, the dark ones are blighted. A microwave radiometer can trace the Mississippi River as a ribbon of blue or detect the coolness of Los Angeles at night, even through the clouds. The sea, the land, the snow, mountains, rivers, vegetation. Everything has its distinctive signature as seen by the different eyes of science. This satellite's name is Nimbus. Its basic job, to see the weather while in orbit. But it also does other things. It not only sees, it gathers data. Once every day, Nimbus will wake up a black box on a floating island in the Arctic. It will ask it about tremors, ice breakups, and temperatures. And then it will relay that information to ground stations. During the same workday, Nimbus will ask other questions of many other roving reporters. It will ask buoys near Puerto Rico, Bermuda, Hawaii, and Alaska what the water and wind are like. It will check with a ship in the Antarctic. 
even an Air Weather Service observation plane. A busy day, especially since Nimbus' basic job is to note cloud and atmospheric conditions, to do research into advanced weather systems. Already, Tyros operational satellites keep us better informed than ever before about the whereabouts and changes in sizes of hurricanes. ATS, the applications technology satellite, parked in one place over the equator, can give us valuable information on the development and movement of jet streams, large thunderstorms, and for the first time, detailed views of tornado producing clouds. Most of all, with regular satellite reports, the weatherman doesn't have to be satisfied anymore with knowing about less than 20% of the Earth's weather, and much of that irregularly. He now has over a million pictures of weather coverage of the whole world, and is sharing them directly with weathermen in about 50 other countries, and exchanging them with Russia on a direct link, the cold line to Moscow. Nowadays, any nation can have instant cloud cover pictures of local weather by building or buying an inexpensive ground station to get them from a satellite every day. The system is called APT, Automatic Picture Transmission. It permits people around the world to tune in a satellite and receive weather pictures. In many cases, it's the only way they have of getting a broad view of local conditions. APT pictures can be used for many purposes. These pilots, for instance, are provided with pictures of the weather ahead of their flight. John B. Tuke, a radio amateur who lives in Scotland, built one of his own just as a hobby. Several times a day, each time the satellite passes over, he can get pictures that tell him what his local weather is going to be that day. Satellites have shown weathermen that the atmosphere contains great spiral storms arranged in patterns more extensive than had ever before been realized. Now, from having seen the behavior of many of them, he has begun to associate bright, discrete clouds like these with severe weather, thunderstorms, and tornadoes. But we still don't know enough. Even the immense progress we've made so far will seem small if the scientist can find the secret of how world weather systems are born, how they develop, and what makes them decline. If someday we could know more about the weather, everywhere, for a long time, then we'd be able to make super early warning forecasts, two weeks in advance. We read you well. Can you give us a position report at this time? Over. We are approximately 1,000 miles east of Newfoundland. Pan Am Cooper 796. Over. Sir, Pan Am 796, this is Goddard Mobile number one. Roger your position. Suppose we start now with the tone modulation. Roll the recorder. Rolling. Roger, here it comes. Near Washington, D.C., NASA researchers talk with an aircraft 2,000 miles away with the help of a satellite 22,000 miles up. The satellite acts as a perfect mirror. It's the communications link between the ground and the plane. The ground station uses only a small battery-powered transmitter and receiver, like the kind used by taxicab companies, but with a special antenna. He can do it any time with complete reliability. Important? Well, Wendy's father may not realize it, but his pilot is limited in his communication and can't count on being able to talk 2,000 miles away. 
In fact, he can't even talk reliably to the ground except when he's approaching or leaving the terminal. In overwater flights like this, to keep a safe distance from other planes, he has to fly through a corridor 2,000 feet high and 120 miles wide. And he has to be at least 20 minutes behind the plane ahead. Tomorrow, satellites could provide better communication and help with navigation and air traffic control. This would reduce the restrictions on overwater flights. What about people who don't travel, who don't fly, who don't go to sea? It's to them that communication satellites may come to mean the most. Already, this inexpensive antenna system is available to tie emerging nations into the growing worldwide communication satellite system. A system which already makes it possible to span oceans and continents to relay voices, printed material, and television coverage of important events. In India today, only in or near New Delhi can children enjoy television. But by 1980, all India could be served by its own TV satellite, reserved for educational purposes. A chance to learn about agriculture, language, health, mechanical skills, and the higher disciplines can be available to everybody. Satellites are being asked to solve other problems. Find the missing lifeboat and find it before it's too late. Nowadays, our best picture of the world doesn't quite fit together. Until recently, there was no way to link the many separate ground surveys that have grown up over centuries of geography, because we can't survey along the surface of the ocean. A lifeboat could radio its position and still not be found. An airplane, if it flew only by its charts in a jump from Chicago to Sydney, could miss by miles. One of our problems now is to tie together all the separate continental survey systems we now have. Heights and distances, which can't be directly measured in relation to each other, can be mathematically related to the orbit of a spacecraft. Knowing more about the shapes of orbits, we can learn more about the real shape of the Earth which will tell us more about the shapes of orbits until, within a few years, we hope to be able to locate any object on Earth within an accuracy of 30 feet. All right, which continent do we live on? North America. Very good. Can you show me where we live on that? Yes. Yeah. Very good. So what do you call this? North Atlantica. Today's picture of the world might as well be Wendy's simple puzzle, but it will change. Here goes fun. More and more, what Wendy and her brother know and what they do down by the surface of the earth will be the cause and the effect of what happens up in the sky. Thank you.